I'd like to reiterate my delight and appreciation for the marvelous hospitality which I'm experiencing here and for the delightful serendipities of seeing friends going back many, many years, including to my uh, years at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. Having examined at some length the priority of the missional community as the strategy God's Spirit uses to carry out God's mission, we turn now to the leadership of such communities. There's a theological significance in this sequence. The general vocation of the missional church must be dealt with before we turn to the special vocation of those who carry out the ministry of leadership within it. This parallels the ecumenical consensus about baptism. The corporate celebra celebration of baptism is the community's acknowledgement of God's faithfulness in building his church one by one. It is as such the act of calling and setting apart of each Christian for her or his vocation as a witness within the missional community. We are becoming used to speaking of baptism as the general ordination of all Christians to their calling before we think about the special ordination of some. The latter is dependent for its meaning upon the former. This understanding of baptism is thus the framework for the theology and practice of the so-called ordered ministries. Special ordination is a subset of general ordination, and the vocation of the entire people of God precedes, surrounds, and shapes the vocation of its specialized servants. This is, of course, all based on the conviction that the church is missionary by its very nature, and its corollary that the particular missional community is the primary agent of that vocation. Now, this understanding of the missional church implies, as I suggested yesterday, a radical revision of traditional ecclesiologies, which have, as I noted, largely neglected the central biblical theme of mission, of sentness. The doctrinal challenge, I think, today is to develop every theme and sub-theme relating to the theology and practices of the church from the central and foundational understanding of the church's missional vocation. So if at this point we could continue and talk about sacraments, about worship, about spiritual practices, about community, koinonia, the theme that came up yesterday, we will continue talking about missional leadership. And our focus is here because missional leadership is of such profound importance for the worthy walking of missional communities. We must ask why and how is missional leadership of such importance for the worthy walking of witnessing communities. And to get into that question, we will consider first, very briefly, the roots of ordered ministry in Christendom in order then to assess the situation in which we find ourselves after Christendom. And with a, a plea for understanding to my scholarly colleagues, I am radically generalizing. I hope that it is responsible generalizing. We're, mo we're moving on to two, the roots of ordered ministry in Christendom. Without any claims to comprehensiveness, and I underline that, no claims to comprehensiveness, I will paint in broad strokes the process of the ordering of ministry within the Western Christendom project. My purpose is to place in high relief the situation within which we find ourselves today as Christendom is ending. We begin with the theme of office in the New Testament scriptures, bearing in mind that the term its office itself is a construct of ecclesial tradition that's imported into this discussion. Our theme is set against the background of the apostolic mission strategy as I interpreted it in yesterday's lecture. That strategy was and is to form communities of witness whose calling is to continue the apostolic witness which brought them into existence and to do so by together walking worthy of the calling to which they have been called. The New Testament investigation of this apostolic mission strategy makes clear that these witnessing communities had leaders. Knowing that this is somewhat risky, I will, for the sake of our discussion, propose some summarizing statements about the way that the scripture addresses this leadership, these ordered ministries within the formation and continuing activity of faithful missional communities. Although there's not a lot of documentary stuff there, it can be argued that structures of leadership were an essential part of the early Christian movement. The apostolic missionaries who planted communities to continue the Christian mission in particular places 
identified those whom they discerned to be the Spirit's gifts to these communities for various ministries of leadership. They are described in diverse ways with terms such as apostles, overseers, later bishops, elders, deacons, or ministers. The pastoral epistles address the qualifications and practices of these, quote, officers, unquote, explicitly, but there are several references scattered throughout the epistles and acts that would allow one to conclude that structured leadership was a given, perhaps a necessity, but that the structures themselves were diverse. The emphasis of all four Gospels upon the calling and formation of the disciples clearly underlines their particular importance for the subsequent apostolic mission. In general, however, the structures of leadership do not really form the central emphasis of the New Testament scriptures. They appear rather to have been a part of the contextualizing of the various communities in their particular locations. The necessary functions of leadership are in some way carried out so that the witnessing communities can function in their particular settings, but the shapes and forms of that leadership vary. It is indeed striking that the one mention of overseers and deacons in the unquestioned Pauline epistles is in the salutation to Philippians, after which they are never mentioned again. And the entire epistle clearly focuses upon the entire community and not solely upon its leadership. In their desire to re-engage the mandate of the apostolic church, reformed ecclesiologists tend to gravitate to Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 for their scriptural understanding of the ordered ministry. Marcus Bart calls this section the constitution of the church. Verses 11 to 12 are the crux. And here's how Bart translates them. He, Christ, is the one who appointed these to be apostles and those to be prophets, some to be evangelists and others to be teaching shepherds to equip the saints for the work of service for building up the Messiah's body. The purpose of these appointments is especially important, to equip the saints for the work of service for building up Messiah's body. That is, if you will, the missional mandate of every particular community to do the work of service or ministry that builds up the body of Christ before a watching world. It is a definition of the practice of walking worthily, and that work needs to be equipped. So how will that happen? It happens through the distinctive persons whose functions are laid out at the beginning of the text. Christ gives gifts to the church in the form of certain persons. These persons are all, as Marcus Bart points out, ministers of the word. They share the common task of speech in the service of God's mission and God's message. In diverse ways, they serve the proclamation of the word, be it apostolically, prophetically, evangelistically, pastorally, and pedagogically. It takes, as it seems, a range of gifted people to provide the word formation that truly equips the saints for their shared calling, which is the work of ministry that builds up Christ's body. What these ministers of the word do in their various ways enables the missional community in a particular place to walk worthy of its calling, which is the overarching theme with which the Ephesian constitution of the church actually began. The power of these ordered ministries is the power of the word at work in the community. Formation by the word makes it possible to respond to the apostolic imperatives as a privilege and an honor a spirit-enabled obedience. So whether they're called apostles or prophets or evangelists or teaching pastors or overseers or bishops or elders or deacons, their work is subservient to the missional calling of the communities they lead. Quoting Marcus Bart again, the task of the special ministers mentioned in Ephesians 4.11 is to be servants in that ministry which is entrusted to the whole church. Their place is not above but below the great number of saints who are not adorned by resounding titles. Every one of the special ministers is a servus servorum dei, a servant of the servants of God. They are, and going on in my own words, they are not mediators between their communities in Christ, although they certainly proclaim Christ. They are not primarily liturgists, although their communal worship is reflected in the citation of corporate prayers, creedal affirmations, and hymns that are scattered throughout the texts. 
They are not custodians of arcane mysteries to be preserved for the initiates, although they certainly recognize the difference between milk-drinking and meat-eating Christians and deal with it sensitively. They are continuing the rabbinical ministry of Jesus, teaching the disciples in each community what it means to know this Jesus now as risen Lord and to be his witnesses where they are sent. The only power they have as they carry out their task is the power of the Holy Spirit who uses their frail human efforts to evoke faith and enable the obedience and draw together one missional community after another. The only tangible source resource they will ultimately have is the scriptures, which begin to appear and to be collected. Gospels and epistles mainly addressed to or formulated for particular missional communities. The credentials for such missional servants are not standardized. It is not who they are, but what God is making them into that counts. Their authority is not innate, but conferred, not so much their essence as their function, an outworking of the word which they proclaim and expound and demonstrate. That basic pattern of missional leadership undergoes enormous changes then in the course of Christendom. As the church moves from the margins to the center of society, as it is given the mixed blessings of wealth and property and power, the diversely ordered ministries of the missional church in the apostolic and sub-apostolic period change. That's the understatement of the morning. (laughs) Much of this change is appropriate contextualization. As we said, there is no specific polity or structure for church leadership laid out for us in the New Testament. With the essentially multicultural character of the early church, which is both intention and struggled for reality from Pentecost on, come diverse ways of organizing the body of Christ for its missional vocation in particular places. But much of the change is also, as we look back upon the centuries of the Christendom Project, problematic. What was originally missional leadership becomes something different when the sense of the missional location of the church itself begins to fade. The ecclesiastical terminology that emerges in Christendom is evidence that the church no longer understands itself as missionary by its very nature. The word presbyter or elder, which becomes the most widely used concept for missional leadership in the particular community, evolves ultimately into the modern term priest. The legacy of Christendom is, however, that this term priest does not mean elder anymore in the New Testament sense. The concept has the etymological shell of the biblical presbyter, but its kernel is now the hierois, the sacerdotes, the priest of sacred rites and prerogatives, whose ministrations do not so much equip the saints as they supply the saints what they need for their own salvation. This office, within the now essential historic succession of bishops who alone can make men into priests, make men into priests, evolves gradually into a human divine institution whose special functions are dogmatically necessary for the salvation of the people. The separation between clergy and laity becomes a divinely maintained order, and ordination becomes a sacrament. The church is identified with its hierarchy, from pope to bishop to priest to deacon. And the ecclesial hierarchy administers salvation in a church now defined by its geography, its cultural hegemony, and its partnership with the state. In a Europe in which everyone lives within hearing range of church bells, Mission disappears from the theology of the church. We're all already Christians. But the theologies of office become ever larger and more complex. The Reformation challenges those centuries of institutional evolution with its strong assertion of the priesthood of all believers and its emphasis upon the essential teaching ministry to equip the saints. Although there is no language of mission here, there is something profoundly missional in the the Reformers' commitment to the biblical literacy and doctoral understanding of the entire faith community. Luther and Calvin translate the Bible into the vernacular and write catechisms and institutes institutes to teach the faith to the laity. The catechetical formulation always moves from doctrine to practice so that the concern to walk worthily of our calling is present even though our calling is not redefined as missional. 
as Alan Roxburgh notes, the dominant model of church leadership, leadership shifts at the Reformation from priest to pedagogue. The New Testament emphasis upon teaching ministries to equip the saints is reclaimed, but it functions differently in a Christendom which is largely unchallenged in the magisterial Reformation. Calvin devotes much attention to the relevant relevance, relevance of Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 for the formation and structuring of the church. But after centuries of Christendom, he has some problems with Christ's gifts of some to be apostles, prophets, and evangelists. So he argues in the Institutes, these three functions were not established in the church as permanent ones, but only for that time during which churches were to be erected where none existed before, in other words, before Christendom. He acknowledges that there might be some special situations in which these offices become necessary again, but they will remain, in his view, extraordinary. But he goes on, next come pastors and teachers whom the church can never go without. Of lasting significance is, of course, the massive reorientation of the understanding of office away from an ontological priesthood that is theologically necessary for the spiritual welfare of the believers to a more functional understanding of office that focuses upon the service of the church, the upbuilding of the believers, and the integrity of the community. The Reformed churches saw in the great diversity of terms and structures of office in the New Testament a rationale for diverse and complementary ministries in the service of God and God's people. They also welcomed patterns of ordered ministry that eschewed the accumulation of both temporal and spiritual power in one person, especially the bishop. We Presbyterians are especially noted for that uh, issue. The result has been the reformed polities of complementary offices, the teaching elder, the ruling elder, the pastor, and the deacon. In the almost 500 years of Protestantism, there's been an enormous proliferation of concepts and structures of office in which the old patterns of Christendom and the revisions of the Reformation are intertwined and adapted. For all the talk about the priesthood of all believers, there are many traces of Christendom's legacy in the ways that ordered ministry actually functions. The clergy-laity distinction persists in spite of all Protestant affirmations that we are all part of the laos, the laity of God. Congregants still tend to think that their ministers are there to provide the services that meet their religious needs based on the assumption that their ordinations however celebrated, conveyed a special spiritual status on them. One might say that the pedagogue model of the Reformation did not replace the priest, but merged with it. That merger continues on in the modern metaphor of the minister as professional, as suggested by Alan Roxburgh, with priestly attitudes and expectations operative, whether the emphasis is on the professional technician or the therapist or the manager. So three, ordered ministry after Christendom. As Christendom ends and the Western world becomes an ever more difficult mission field, the churches are challenged, as we said, to reclaim their missional calling. That's the vocation of the missional community we were addressing in yesterday's lecture. This process means that their inherited forms of leadership are also subject to review and change, and change is happening, although not without a lot of resistance. Those priestly attitudes and expectations are, as I just noted, very resilient. The drive to maintain Christendom or even to return to it is widespread across the spectrum from right to left. Now, there are examples, of course, of very successful Christendom maintenance if the measure of success is numbers, budgets, well-attended programs, and satisfied members. Much of our formal theological education still has the Christendom priest pedagogue professional in view, in spite of all our protestations that we are all in touch with the changing context. However, the focus upon organizational maintenance may take concrete shape. It effectively obstructs any movement toward continuing conversion to missional calling. It appears that maintenance leaders rarely equip saints for missional vocation. If, however, Christendom over time generated ministry structures oriented to hierarchical power, to rank and title, to privilege and position, to the trappings and perquisites of office, what happens to all of that when the Christendom project begins to disintegrate? What happens to these inherited orders of ministry where the Spirit does surprise a community 
with conversion to missional vocation. For communities are beginning to move from reaction to the end of Christendom to exploration of what missional obedience might now look like. Questions about the cultural captivity of Western Christendom are raised and discussed, as threatening and unsettling as they are. Ministers with their members are beginning to read the scriptures with different questions in mind, questions about vocation and alternativeness and liberation from idolatry. There is a growing awareness that there are basic patterns of missional faithfulness that can be identified and nurtured and tested. Out of this ferment, there is emerging a willingness to examine new and yet very old understandings of the purpose and practice of the ordered ministry. Communities are recognizing that there are people who, as ministers of the word, do in fact equip the saints for the work of service for building up the Messiah's body but that what they do is intimately related to the ministry of the entire community and not something just done on its behalf. How many congregations are trying to change these deeply rooted patterns of office and authority as they describe in their worship bulletins all the members as the ministers and put up signs over the exit doors reminding their members that they're now entering the mission field and that they're being sent? As the disintegration of Christendom continues and these explorations of missional vocation after Christendom gain traction, they will have far-reaching implications for our ministerial polities and our theological education. Borrowing this concept of patterns from the project coordinated by Lois Barrett that produced the study Treasure in Clay Jars, Patterns in Missional Faithfulness, I will suggest three patterns of missional leadership that, as I see it, are crucial to the continuing conversion of the church to its vocation of witness, crucial to the communities walking worthy of its calling. And the first of these is the equipping priority of the word. Missional leadership is centered upon and shaped by the word of God written. The initially verbal testimony of those apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teaching shepherds which equipped the saints for the work of service, was formally captured in the various documents that ultimately became the New Testament canon. As we noted yesterday, the apostolic scriptures became this Holy Spirit's instrument for the continuing formation of missional communities for their calling. And that formation happens as their leaders serve as the interpreters, the catalysts, the resources for the exposition of that word in all its formative power. For the Reformed concept of divided and complementary offices, this means that ruling and teaching elders, pastors, and deacons are all to function as word equippers. All ordered ministries are needed for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Every Christian is a witness who belongs to and represents Christ. There are, however, subtle ways that we resist this broad and inclusive understandings of the ways that the word equips the saints. Again, our vocabulary itself reveals a lot. Terms like preaching and proclamation tend to narrow our understanding of the enormous variety of ways in which in the New Testament the communication of the scriptural word actually works in the community. Gerhard Friedrich pointed out that Martin Luther used one German verb, predigen, preach, for the translation of more than 30 Greek verbs having to do with verbal communication. If only the few who are clerically qualified can validly articulate the word of God, then missional formation is not likely to happen. Certainly, if we, if we reforms are, not, are to take missional vocation seriously, then we should emphasize that not only are the elders and deacons and pastors all word equippers in their various ways, but all Christians are called to share in the communication of the gospel and should be equipped to do so. I am persuaded and have often said that we in the Reformed tradition need to reclaim the teaching eldership. I've linked that plea with the critique of our decision in 1983 to replace that term in our constitutional documents with the term minister of word and sacrament. I believe that for many reasons that move is deepening the clergy lay divide and handicapping us as we seek to respond to the challenges of our changing context. I will not make my pop myself popular in all quarters of my church by saying that. But I am not concerned about the reclamation of the teaching eldership for reasons of authority or office. 
The purpose of this particular ordered minister is not to entrust the word to the credentialed few so that everyone else might be dependent upon them. That is yet another way to preserve the priestly office of Christendom. It is the priority of the word for missional formation that requires that we all have the opportunity to engage scriptures in all the fullness and power of their meaning. For that, we need learned clergy, you. By that, I mean that we need students and expositors of the word who are themselves convinced that the scriptures are the Holy Spirit's instrument for the ongoing missional formation of the community. And they are equipped with the tools to expound the scriptures missionally. They contribute to the equipping of the saints by helping the community to explore how the Spirit formed missional communities then and does it now. The missional community will be formed through the work of word equippers who in a great breadth of ways can guide the congregations into the risky confrontation with the Bible. We have to risk unchaining the Bible. We have to risk real biblical literacy in our communities rather than dependence upon the learned few. Risk the freewheeling conversation about what the Spirit is really saying to the churches through these scriptures. It is risky constantly to ask the text missional questions. It is risky to allow scripture to become the lenses through which we see ourselves and our neighborhood. It is risky to move forward in the conviction that we are to walk worthy of our calling and that the biblical documents not only show us what that looks like, but tutor us in the practices that are truly worthy. The risk is that we might discover how that really happens and what that really means. The risk is that we might find ourselves being converted. We might be confronted by the discovery that our cherished and secure notions about who we are as church and what we are for need to be revised. We might find ourselves being transformed by the renewing of our minds. As the encounter with the scriptures reveals our conformities and God's spirit enables us to put them aside. Such expectations of the encounter with the biblical word are countercultural to be sure. There are widely favored approaches to scriptural interpretation that do not start with God's mission or the mission vocation of God's people. They are not interested in the contention that this is what the biblical testimony is really all about. There are those who move rather from the context, from the human experience, from assessment of human religious needs to the text, asking questions the more often than not, than not filter out the missional mandate and replace it with various responses calculated to meet those needs. And there are those who assume from the outset that the Bible is about my vertical relationship with God, my savedness, my eternity, and whose filters effectively evade all the claims about our mandate to be witnesses to the inbreaking reign of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even after Christendom, there is great resistance to recognizing that the biblical story is from beginning to end about God's mission and the calling of his people to be the witnesses and the parable of that mission. In the missional community, we need to experience the equipping power of the word in the diverse ways laid out in Ephesians chapter 4. We need to be confronted by the biblical witness as it shapes us apostolically. That is, as the word roots us in our Lord's mission and joins us to his sent out people as those who continue the apostolic vocation. We need to encounter the prophetic formation of the word, the word becoming flesh in our concrete situations, throwing the bright light of God's justice on the situations of injustice that surround us. The prophetic ministry of the word equips the saints for the work of kingdom ministry that gives evidence of the goodness and newness of the reign of God in Christ now breaking in. The evangelistic ministry of the word equips the saints by showing us how to tell the story to those who have not heard it. How, as John Mackay first put it back in 1928, to win a right to be heard. How to, in, his, uh, in the words of Paul, share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us, as Paul defines that in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. The pastoral and pedagogical ministries of the word equip the saints for the work of service by practicing the healing and restorative power of the gospel, by engaging in the cure of souls as a, a ministry of witness making, by confronting our weakness and frailty and brokenness as arenas of God's action that generate witness to the goodness and grace of God's salvation. There is critical agreement to these, that these last two terms in the catalog of five 
forms of word ministry are not distinctive, but they are hyphenated. We should read always teaching pastor or pastoral teacher. All pastoral ministry, all work of caring and nurturing and restoration shall in some way teach the word so that the saints may be equipped. All teaching shall be characterized by the care and oversight of attentive and responsible shepherds so that the saints are equipped. These are concrete ways of formation that turn us and our world around. They require and bring about transformation by the renewing of our, our minds. They entail that mindedness Paul speaks of in Philippians that would lead us to risk imitating the mind of Christ in the ways that we relate to each other. This biblical formation is what the missional community needs in order to walk worthy of its calling, and it is the defining priority of every form of ordered ministry. It is the central task of missional leadership. Secondly, the collegial character of missional leadership. The theological work done by the Consultation on Church Union left some important resources for a missional theology of ministry, even if the organizational outcomes of that project are not overly edifying. Their definition of the collegiality of ordered ministry, if read through missional lenses, is helpful, and I quote one of their documents. All ministry in the Uniting Church will be collegial. Baptism and ordination alike associate the individual with others who share the same call. The ministry is a single task common to many, thus no minister is independent or autonomous. Collegial relationships obtain among persons in different ministries as well among those of the same ministries. Such relationships should include laypersons as well as bishops, presbyters, and deacons. The interpersonal character of collegiality is a basis for partnership and governance and gives life and substance to the institutional structures of the church. So far, the COCU document. Collegiality is defined by the many terms in this statement that expound it. Sharing interdependent, inclusive, interpersonal, partnership. Although the term is hackneyed, it applies here. Collegial ministry is relational, it takes place in networks of relationships, demonstrates the nature of God's love through the, the way that these relationships actually work. This would be an appropriate place to bring the theme koinonia. Seen through missional lenses, the collegiality of leadership is a basic form of witness that guides the entire community into its formation to be Christ's witnesses. How the leaders of the community interact, how they leave love and serve one another, how they do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than themselves, beginning of Philippians 2, equips the entire community for their work of service. Community formation happens through the mentoring and modeling that is the constant responsibility of the leadership community, the collegium of persons with distinctive gifts that are needed for the equipping of the saints. If the community is to respond faithfully to its biblical formation, if it is to walk worthy of its calling, then the biblical formation, which is the priority of the missional leadership, needs to be supported and fleshed out in the collegial relationships of the equippers of the saints. The collegial character of missional leadership is a pervasive theme throughout the New Testament. When Jesus came to that time in the disciples' formation for missional leadership, uh, when they needed some field education experience, he sent them out two by two. When Peter stood up to proclaim the gospel at Pentecost, the text notes that he was standing in the midst of them, in the community on behalf of whom he proclaimed. When Paul set out on his mission from Antioch, he went with a team, as he always did on all his apostolic ventures. Most of the New Testament epistles are authored by an apostolic team, Paul and Sosthenes, Paul and Timothy, Paul and all the members of God's family who are with him, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Missional leadership in the New Testament is expressly and intentionally collegial. Since it is a message of healing love, of reconciliation, new beginnings, and thus of transformed relationships, its witness is always and essentially relational. The gospel is good news that can and must be acted out wherever it is received and passed on, and the proposition of agape love is made known by the demonstration of agape love, which begins in the apostolic teams and becomes the essential DNA of the newly formed missional community. 
To implement such collegiality for the missional formation of communities will mean that much that we inherit from Christendom will be subject to critique and change. The privileges and spiritual specialness of ordained office need stringent review. The clergy lady distinction, distinction is not simply a useful difference in function. It still connotes a church with two castes. As I already emphasized, in spite of almost five centuries of Protestant emphasis upon the priesthood of all believers, Christendom attitudes about office are still powerfully present in our congregations. Try as we will, especially in the Reformed legacy, to correct the impression that there's something sacerdotal, something necessary, necessarily mediatorial, some given in the ordained minister our, minister, our members still want to put us on priestly pedestals. Although Presbyterians ordain teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons with basically the same ordination right, our members, by and large, look upon their ministers, their pastors, as a distinctive and spiritually privileged breed. Those attitudes, those remnants of Christendom obstruct the practices of collegiality. They fortify the impression that the words and actions of ordained clergy are more Christian, more holy, and more effective than what ordinary Christians do. They diminish the central importance of the public witness of the entire community by focusing on the actions and personality of particular office holders. How shall we liberate both congregations and their ministers from these constrictive mindsets? It's obviously a profound theological problem, but we could start with language. We spoke of the translation problem with regard to the enormous variety of ways the gospel is communicated in the Greek narrative of the New Testament and the reductionist mindset that results when our members always hear preach and proclaim and don't see themselves doing either. We could examine our speech to see how many ways we violate or diminish the fundamental collegiality of missional vocation. We could refuse to use the term solo pastor. We could question what possible sense there still is in the use of the term reverend. We might look at questions like vestments. Do our congregations understand the Geneva gowns signal that there's a credentialed teacher standing in front of the congregation and nothing more? We reforms might ask ourselves how the collegiality of missional leadership could be made more explicit in the ways that we practice the diverse and complementary offices. We can make the discipline of the selection of ruling elders and deacons as careful and painstaking as the selection of teaching elders. We could require that these ordained officers be rigorously educated and credentialed for their responsibilities as part of the missional leadership of the church. We could ask ourselves searching questions about the restriction of sacramental presidency to ordained ministers. The Lord's table is the central encounter with the risen Lord in our midst meeting us, nourishing us, and sending us, then should we not model there the collegiality of missional leadership? But the collegiality of missional leadership is jeopardized not only by the momentum of Christendom, which keeps priestly images alive in our minds and communities. There is a further chemistry at work that creates even more problems for the collegiality of ordered ministries. Missional communities in our culture are handicapped by some of the distinctively North American factors that shape us. The congregation as private association, as voluntaristic society, as member funded and member owned for the benefit of its members, has a hard time recognizing the mission, missional collegiality that is essential to walking worthy of our calling. Every Presbyterian session has heard someone say in the last 12 months, what this church needs to do is run itself like a good business. And I expect that this comment is also heard in vestries, boards of deacons, and church councils. There are undoubtedly important dimensions of stewardship that are addressed here, but there are also cultural influences that get in the way of missional collegiality. What is happening to the collegial ministries that equip the saints for the work of service when we adopt the language and values of the corporate world and describe ministers as chief executive officers heads of staff, executive pastors, directors of this and directors of that. Why is it that ministers' studies have become offices? Those may be more superficial evidences of the problem. There is, at a much deeper level, 
reason to speak today of the crisis of ordered ministries, especially in traditional denominations. Anyone who labors within the structures of the organized church has discovered evidences of this crisis. One third of our Presbyterian pastors today do not go on from a first call to a second call. One third. Since becoming a seminary faculty person, I have dwelt with the, dealt with a disturbing number of my graduates who went on to appointments as associate pastors only to experience in often devastating ways the failure of collegiality, especially with so-called senior pastors. Burnout is one of the most frequently discussed crises affecting those in ordered ministry. The ethos of the corporate world joins with the values of the marketplace to complicate even further the practice of collegiality. I have contended that in the United States, the partnership of church and state has been replaced by the partnership of church and marketplace, and the marketplace appears to be winning. What is going on when members are treated like customers and to begin to understand themselves that way? What is the theology of mission that propagates mission statements that are intended to function primarily as advertising slogans? What kind of ecclesiology have we de developed if our sense of ourselves is that we should be user-friendly, full-service, consumer-sensitive churches? What shall we make of the practical redefinition of the ordered ministries as a mixture of narrow-gauge behavioral therapist, organizational development expert, and program impresario? I remember a church in Louisville that proudly announced its express worship service in and out in 30 minutes. <laughs> the centrality of the missional community which we emphasized in yesterday's lecture finds its parallel here. Missional leadership must itself be and function as missional community. That is what the pattern of collegiality is all about as it shapes the community's witness before a watching world. And then thirdly and finally, missional leadership and the personal apostolate. We've discussed the role of missional leadership in terms of the priority of the word for the equipping of the saints and the essential collegiality of leadership which models and mentors worthy walking. Up until now, we've stressed primarily the communal character of the missional community's vocation, how its life together witnesses to the gospel before a watching world. It's unquestionable that this is a major emphasis of the scriptures. There are, however, two fundamental interactive dimensions of the missional community. There is the dimension of its gathering, and there is the dimension of its scattering, its sending. With the gradual establishment of Christianity in Western Christendom, the focus was more and more on the gathering of the church. The more we assume that our entire culture had been Christianized, which is itself a curious term, the less important was the dimension of our scattering, because wherever we went, we were still within the Christian culture at whose center stood the church. Thus, we were most Christian when we gathered, but we were still Christian when we were scattered. And there was not real reason to think about being sent. We lost any sense of that ancient final injunction of the liturgy, from which the word mass comes. Ita missa est. Go, thou art sent. Why should we think of ourselves as sent? Our culture is already Christian. The apostolic mission has been accomplished. Thus, Calvin's problems with Ephesians 4. The kingdom of God was actually here in the structures and offices of the church. Thus, what we did when we assembled in our ecclesiast ecclesiastical buildings came to be seen as the real reason we existed. Our liturgies, our sacraments, our music, our priestly action all gained a spiritual worth that was an end in itself. They lost any sense of equipping for the work of service. The primary service of God was the gathered and ordered worship of the community. In German, worship service, Gottesdienst, the service of God. To walk worthily meant to engage in the gathered life of the church faithfully, to participate in the sacraments, to share in the assembled worship and praise of God. Isn't it still true that for most people, becoming a Christian is equated with starting to go to church? The problem is not the emphasis upon the gathered church. The problem is the loss of the essential linkage between the gathered church and the scattered church. That we have no sense of sentness is in effect the expression of the loss of missional vocation in both our theology of the church and our practice of the faith. Now, 
With the end of Christendom, that essential sentness reasserts itself every time we walk out of the church into the secularized post-Christian world, which is now our mission field. If the gathered life of the church is about our sh discipleship, then the sending is about our apostolate. Like the biblical disciples, we go to school with Jesus as we gather in his name in order to be sent out by him to proclaim the message. Missional leadership centered upon the word, practiced with evangelical collegiality, must serve the gathered church by preparing each member for his or her apostolate. However one calls it, the ministry of the laity, ministry in the workplace, Christian living Monday through Saturday, the presenting issue for the missional community is this. How do we equip each other to walk worthy of our calling in the personal apostolates into which God sends us every time we make the transition from gathered to scattered community? If a missional community is going to grasp this constant missional movement from discipleship to apostolate and back again, then it will be essential that its missional leadership help it to encounter scripture as it equips them for this apostolate. This will require some retooling on the part of missional leaders. We became very adept over centuries at reading the biblical word in such a way that the obvious could be ignored. In Mark's account of the calling of the Twelve, the missional understanding of vocation can be seen as exemplary of the pervasive ministerial orienta uh, missional orientation of the New Testament scriptures. We've already referred earlier to the reference in Mark 3, 13 to 15, to the calling of the disciples who were also to become apostles. We need also to pay attention to the, to the dimensions of missional calling, which are clearly delineated in this text. And he pointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. There are three purpose statements here which make up a fully developed theology of the missional church. The first dimension of the disciples' calling was and is to be with Jesus. These four words are a comprehensive theology of the purpose and action of the gathered church. We gather to be with Jesus because he promises to be present when we gather in his name. We gather to celebrate and testify to the fact that he is present. This is the motivating power of our public worship. We encounter him present in the proclamation of the word. With the second Helvetic confession, we are bold to claim the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. He is present to us in the exposition of the biblical word. We meet him in his promised spiritual presence at the table, and we receive his gift of body and blood to nourish and cleanse us. And we are told as we do that, that as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The text itself reveals the essential linkage of the gathered dimension with the scattered and the sending dimension. Going out from that table, we proclaim the salvation accomplished by our Lord's death and the assurance of our future with him, which he will seal in his promised return. In the Markan text, to be with him is followed immediately by to be sent out to proclaim the message. The gathering leads immediately into the sending and the scattering. All through scripture, the movement from gathering to scattering is basic. This is the fundamental missional movement of the people of God, from their call together life, in which the priority of word ministry and the collegiality of calling are practiced, to their sent and scattered life, in which they serve as Christ's witnesses. This is the basic thrust of our Lord's emphasis upon our calling to be light and leaven and salt. The test of our missional leadership lies here, at the junction between gathering and sending. We walk worthy of our calling in our gathered life so that we can learn how to walk worthy of our calling in our sent out scattered life, in our personal apostolates. We are not to focus upon how successfully we do our gathered life, especially since most of the criteria for success in our culture are suspect anyway, we are to ask how our gathered life has truly prepared us for worthy walking where God is sending us. One of my colleagues in homiletics put it very well in a discussion just a few days ago. She said that in her work as a teacher of preachers, she is constantly asking, what is the connection between what people hear, say, and do inside the sanctuary and Christian worship 
and the way they interpret and respond to the world outside the sanctuary. This is the question that must energize missional leaders if their missional communities are to walk worthy of their calling. But let me point to a particularly important nuance of her question. She speaks of the scattered and sent life of the community in terms of how they interpret and respond to the world outside the sanctuary. She's referring, I believe, to the myriad ways in which our post-Christian context challenges us with questions and dilemmas and seductions for which Christendom has not prepared us. Among the great challenges with which our mission field confronts us are the confusion and distortion of the gospel itself, which are the residual deposit of Christendom. As missional communities, we do not live in a neutral or an indifferent world as far as the claims of Christ are concerned. A missiological analysis of our particular context will reveal wide, widely diverse attitudes about the Christian message and its organized expression in the church. The undeniably large numbers of committed and serious Christians are mixed in with many versions of cultural Christians constituting a field that is truly made up of wheat and weeds. Cultural Christianity comes in all kinds of shapes and forms and expressions, but one thing is generally true of all its exponents, and that is the rigorous separation of the Christian faith from every dimension of life, especially the public square and the workplace. For cultural Christians, the idea that Christian identity is centered on the calling to witness is particularly repugnant. Then there are the inoculated former Christians, the intentional rejectors of the gospel, or rather the particular distortion or corruption of it against which they're reacting, been there, done that. Their numbers are legion. There are the convinced modernists who are truly certain that at some point in the 18th or 19th century, a new human race was born, the enlightened and rational European who has moved beyond the intellectual immaturity of the Christendom that preceded him or her. That component of our cultural chemistry dominates the university world. There are also the religious pluralists and individualists, the various versions of Sheilaists, described by Bella and his colleagues in Habits of the Heart, who craft their own religiosity from the resources of the world religions, from New Age spiritualities, and a broad range of repopularized paganisms. Their cultural power is evidenced in the large sections of bookstores devoted to spirituality and religion, which in quantity and diversity far outpace the secular offerings in the general area of Christianity as a visit to any Barnes & Noble or Borders bookstore will make clear. There is also a growing contingent in North American society that is so shaped by the end of Christendom that they are effectively pre-Christian. They have never had any contact with an organizational expression of the Christian faith. They don't know why so much jewelry is shaped as a cross. They're in some ways the most open to Christian witness because it's all so new to them. Their numbers are particularly great here on the West Coast. It is into this diverse mission field that we are sent when we disperse into the world as the gathered church now entering into its apostolates. To equip the saints for the work of service must mean to equip Christian witnesses for this challenging mission field. In its times of gathering, the missional community needs to learn how to translate the gospel into these various contexts. Our discipling must very concretely and practically take account of the challenges that we meet in our apostolates. How shall a Christian teacher in the public school system carry out her apostolate in a context where conversation about the faith is virtually prohibited? How shall a Christian business person carry out his or her apostolic vocation when the neighbor you are to love is your competitor? How shall a Christian accountant advise his or her clients with integrity when the normative conduct of the prevailing culture is to manipulate the financial data for personal gain and reduced taxes. The missional leadership that can engage in this kind of formation for personal apostolates will have to practice a collegiality of shared experience and expertise. There are likely to be more qualified equippers of the saints among the ruling elders who live in that Monday to Saturday world than among the teaching elders. The challenge of personal apostolates, of faithful witness practiced by all those sent out by the gathered community, takes us then to the third component of that concise Markan theology of the missional church. This statement gives all late modern Western Christians pause. 
together with our being with him and our being sent out by him, we are granted the authority to cast out demons. I think that most Presbyterian congregations assume that one of the most important reasons to have a learned clergy is that so that someone can explain why passages like this do not apply to them. <laughs> but it may be one of the most important aspects of the equipping done by missional leadership for the conduct of personal apostolates in our post-Christendom world. Together we need to face fearlessly what Wissthoft prophesied about the Western world over 30 years ago. We are living in a context of neo-paganism, which is becoming ever stronger and more diverse. We need to accustom ourselves to the fact that the demonic, the idolatrous, and the seductive are pervasive aspects of our culture. We are talking about the obvious, both obvious and subtle ways in which people are held captive by forces that are demonic precisely because they are so well camouflaged. In biblical terms, these are those principalities and powers in rebellion against God, which shape our attitudes and values and expectations so effectively that we do not see how contrary to God's goodwill our lives and our societies are becoming. We can talk about the temptations of consumerism, the captivity to consumer credit, the obsessive preoccupation with youthfulness and fitness, the accumulation of things, the dictatorship of wealth, the manipulative power of advertising, the justification of violence in our entertainment, the rationalization of recreational sex. Each of us can add more examples to the list. To walk worthy of our calling over against these tempting forces is, in Mark's text, to demonstrate that in Christ we have the power to cast out such demonic forces. In Christ, there is the liberation of our vision to see the idolatries and demons that hold people captive and the empowering of the will to opt to live alternatively. The formation of the missional community by Scripture will inexorably force these challenges onto our agenda. Missional leadership is called upon to risk engaging these realities as threatening and as unsettling as they are. They are for us the meat offered to idols realities, which test our missionary vocation and afford the opportunity to walk worthily in a new and different direction. The formation of the missional congregation to walk worthy of its calling and the responsibility of its missional leadership to guide its equipping for the work of service are clearly the themes that call for a large conversation. Just as our book, Missional Church, was intended as an invitation to a conversation about what a missionally centered ecclesiology might look like, my intention in these two lectures has been to describe the agenda to frame at least some of the questions that we, in all our diversity, need to engage as Christendom fades from the scene. Because there is so much at stake, because there are so many contending visions that come together here, it is my hope that the conversations themselves will be so guided by God's Spirit that they will be examples of worthy walking. Thank you for the honor of this invitation and for your attention. Thank you.